Good morning. Uh, my name is Ben Lucas and I'm Chair of uh, Public Services at the RSA and I'm one of the Commissioners of the City Growth Commission. Um, I'd like to welcome you all today to the launch of uh, this report, which is the final report of the RSA City Growth Commission. First of all, a few housekeeping matters. Um, can I ask you, uh, if you haven't already done so, to please turn off your mobile phones? Um, Today's launch is being filmed uh, by the BBC and I think they're going to be using clips uh, in their broadcast coverage of uh, our publication today, um, so that's just so you know. We're also live streaming the event um, and uh, so we'd like to welcome everyone who's watching it uh, via the web. And a reminder that the hashtag uh, for the event is hashtag city growth if anyone wants to tweet uh, about the event. And we will be taking, I think, when we get to the Q&A session, uh, some questions uh, via uh, Twitter. So, if I can introduce you to uh, the running order for today, we've got um, uh, an important report that we want to give uh, everyone the full opportunity to discuss. We are very grateful to have uh, Lord Heseltine, the former Deputy Prime Minister, uh, who will be uh, setting the scene uh, for the report. Then Jim O'Neill, the Chair of the City Growth Commission, will be taking us through the main findings of the report. Sir Richard Lees, who's chair of the LGA Cities Board, uh, leader of Manchester City Council and from the Core Cortis, Cities Cabinet, will, be, will then be responding uh, to the report. And we're then going to have a panel discussion uh, with Amanda Clack, who's senior vice president of the, Institute of Charters, the Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyors, uh, Jules Pipe, who's chair of London Councils and the mayor of Hackney, and Tom Reardon, who's the chief executive of Leeds City Council. So this report that we're publishing today is the culmination of a year's work. Um, we, we launched the fact that we were going to be hosting the commission, hosting the commission uh, a year ago in this room and our timing this year has been better by a day than it was last year because uh, we, we were rather badly affected last year by a storm that meant uh, Richard, for example, couldn't get here to be here uh, and in fact most of the City leaders couldn't be here. The only one who could was John Collins from Nottingham, and that was because he'd come down uh, the night before. So we're very fortunate that the, the storm blew over last night um, and that we're therefore able to launch with everyone being present today. The RSA wanted to host this commission because we see there are enormous opportunities in our cities uh, and that those opportunities have gone untapped for far too long. Internationally, we have a picture in which it's increasingly cities that are driving growth. They are the concentrations of productivity, innovation and creativity that will be the future of our economies. Uh, but in Britain, too many of our cities haven't been able to achieve their potential, partly because of a very over-centralised system. So what we wanted to look at through this commission was two things, really. We wanted to understand what is the economic case for um, unleashing growth in our cities and how, to what extent can that contribute to increasing the overall trend rate of growth for the UK economy. But we also wanted to understand what are the barriers that stand in the way of this happening and in particular how can we think pragmatically about how to transition from where we are at the moment to a situation in which cities are far more in control of their own economic destiny. So that's the context in which we run the Commission. We, um, hold, we held evidence sessions across the country over the last year. Many of the people in this room have, have uh, contributed evidence to us for, and we're very grateful uh, for that. And we've also um, had a lot of organisations submit evidence to us. We published six reports during the, the course of the Commission, uh, all in the run-up to our final report. So it's been a process which has engaged a lot of people um, and a process where we've always been very aware, and Jim was very insistent on setting, the, setting this from the outset, there was a ticking clock of, of a year that we had to commit to and we had to deliver our report within that timeline, which was a very good uh, way of concentrating our minds in terms of what we had to achieve within that timescale. Um, and we're obviously very grateful also to the commissioners um, who've been involved uh, in this commission throughout uh, and have contributed their time and their ideas. Uh, many of them are in the room today and... and I think later on uh, either Jim or myself will introduce them, um, and also to the staff um, who've made this possible, Charlotte Aldrich and the rest of the Secretariat who are, who are spotted uh, uh, around the room. So to them also, uh, a great deal of thanks. So it's my very great uh, 
privilege to be able to introduce now Lord Heseltine, um, who I think has been the leading figure in, in recognising the potential of cities a long time before it was fashionable to do so, uh, and who's consistently set a challenge not only for central government in terms of what they need to do to allow cities to achieve that potential, but also what cities themselves need to do to be more ambitious and clear about what their economic opportunities are and to think about their governance. So it's a great pleasure to be able to introduce Lord Heseltine to set the scene for this commission. Well, thank you very much indeed for those very generous words of introduction. Uh, it certainly has been an extraordinary journey for me uh, and one of great excitement to be here to see the progress that has been made. Uh, I will never forget the experiences of Liverpool in 1951 after the riots. And there was one absolutely glaring conclusion to the three weeks I spent in that great city. There was no one in charge. Everybody had explanations as to what was wrong and it was always somebody else's fault. Anything that needed putting right, it was always someone else should do it. Nobody was in charge. And this completely overwhelmed me with its implications because, of course, the power had gone. The decision-making had gone. And the decision-making people had gone. And so, from that moment on, I have spent uh, a great deal of my political career in trying to raise the agenda of devolution. Well, let's state the obvious, devolution is now centre stage. And I, I think that in thanking uh, Jim O'Neill and his colleagues for this report, uh, we should recognise that he pays tribute to the very significant progress that has been made. Uh, he refers specifically to the, the city deals, to the growth deals, and uh, indeed has been generous about the report that uh, I myself produced called No Stone Unturned. The No Stone Unturned report is, I think, unique. Uh, I know of no occasion in, uh, in my lifetime, maybe not be ever, but where one person was given an official from each government department and a, a blank piece of paper and no attempt at any time to influence the conclusion. No minister saw a word of the report until the printing was actually underway. And so it, it, it was a fascinating exercise and I hope has contributed to the remarkable progress that this commission we're celebrating today has made. Looking at the conclusions of uh, the commission, it's quite obvious, and they make a big thing of it, that they concentrate on the 15 metro areas. And I well understand that, because if you want to get the show on the road, go for the low-hanging fruit where you will achieve the fastest uh, results. I fully understand that. And indeed, it coincides with another extremely important development in political terms, which is the speeches that the Chancellor himself has made in Manchester in the course of the last uh, couple of months, one dealing with that extraordinary vision of linking the Humber and the Mersey, and the other dealing with a extraordinarily high-quality science hub based on the uh, universities of the Northwest. So this agenda is now, as I say, centre stage, and the report is a, a very welcome and thorough contribution, concentrating, as I say, on the low-hanging fruits. As someone who has spent a lot of time in the politics of uh, uh, this agenda, I would like to broaden the concept because I think that the Scottish devolution debate has given a momentum to what was already a moving uh, process. Um, and the whole debate about uh, English votes and English laws is going to have to be resolved within a timescale compatible with the Scottish devolution process. Uh, I personally very much welcome that, and I think that English MPs are going to insist 
Well, the moment you talk about English MPs, of course, you cannot just talk about the MPs in the 15 metro areas, because if you were to do that, then you're creating another section of potential aggravation as people feel left behind and left out. And as far as my judgment is, we simply shouldn't leave any part of uh, uh, England out of the process of seeking to devolve power, which really means involving local people in the decisions that actually affect them, as opposed to telling them and imposing on them solutions which others have designed on their behalf. So I believe, that, and the report is completely consistent with this view, the agenda now has to be a national English agenda for devolution. I say English, I, my, I, I hesitate to trespass into uh, the three non-English uh, components of the United Kingdom, but I do sometimes wonder whether they are talking about devolution to their capital cities or whether they're talking about the sort of devolution that I think would be important, which is to the main economic centers that make up their countries. But that is for them to resolve. Um, the, the purpose of this discussion today is of, uh, to address the issue of how we deal with England. I have really got two thoughts that I, I would bring to this morning's debate. And the first is that if you are going to devolve power to the local enterprise partnerships, which are the chosen vehicles um, of the government has committed itself to, then um, I think it has to involve the enthusiasms of the in, entire country. Uh, in other words, you do not allow the Whitehall machine to maintain its monopoly in very substantial parts of England. Because if you allow that machine to remain, it will, first of all, continue to hold sway over very important parts of the economy. And secondly, the mere existence of that machine will enable it to continue in practice, often perhaps not overt and in public, but behind the scenes in the way in which the devolution process is actually working as far as the metro areas are concerned. So the issue that has to be addressed is the nature of the Whitehall machine and the monopoly status that over a century it, it has acquired because that is a very important part of the problem of devolution. That machine is not naturally sympathetic to giving up the power that it has achieved. And so you have to address that. And a very important part of addressing it is for the government to now address the issue of what sort of machinery are we going to have in Whitehall in order to preside over this shift of power away from Whitehall. And you've only got to think about the words I've used, shift of power, to realize high politics is the name of the game. Um, I, I think that it will need the government to recognize a new opportunity. At the moment, you only have to look at the quangos, you have to look at the employment processes and the numbers employed by central government departments to realize that government not only determines policy, they execute policy. They either execute policy directly or by means of the many controls that they use to ensure that uh, central, uh, local government does what central government wants. Um, in the devolved world, I believe that central government should actually do much less. It should become much more preoccupied by quality of output rather than the statistics of delivering services. And uh, the, the second thing, and this is perhaps not as welcome as uh, the devolutionary agenda itself, <laughs> governments are entitled to have policies. They are elected with, with mandates and they cannot uh, be expected to allow a situation to develop where a major metro authority or even a relatively small unitary county can actually say, well, we don't actually want houses or we don't care about education. It's not our priority. Central government are entitled to make sure that they, the manifestos upon which they are elected are carried out. 
And so we're not talking about a sort of free-for-all in which power is just given back in some absolutist way. We're talking about a much more sophisticated arrangement of partnership in which a higher degree of decision-making originates where the people who will implement it exist and work. Uh, and I believe in order to do that, that it is necessary for government to concentrate now on how you implement a, through the Whitehall machine processes of that sort. Uh, it, it is not easy, but unless there is this debate about the practicality of how to do it, the danger is that the existing monopolistic processes will remain with all centralizing instincts that follow from monopolistic processes. So, uh, ending where I began, the agenda is center stage. The time is now. There is no way in which, in my view, the House of Commons is going to pass the Scottish devolution processes unless there is a fair settlement for England of a devolutionary nature. And in order for that, it is necessary for governments, because no one else can do it now, to take the very wide range of reports, such as this one, the speeches that have been produced on the subject, the research information, and turn it into an action plan. And I believe that uh, they will gain immeasurably, and the country will gain immeasurably from a determined uh, attempt to achieve this new way of running this country. I say new way, that's wrong. The way we actually did run this country when we became the great imperial power that we are. Thank you very much. Jim, can I ask you now to um, set out the main themes of uh, the uh, report? And thank you very much, Lord Hazelton. Uh, good morning. Thank you, Ben. Uh, thank you so much, Lord Hesseltine, for uh, such a uh, retrospective presentation and, and conceptualising where, where we've all come from. Uh, it is a huge uh, honour to be stood here 12 months later from what I think was the same room. Uh, who, who would have thought uh, over those 12 months that uh, what we've been focusing on would be quite uh, as topical uh, as, and important as it's become? Uh, ben thanked uh, a lot of people. Uh, it would take up too much of my time to go through them all again, but I would just like to add uh, my own thanks to Charlotte and the staff who have worked so endlessly to push all of us as commissioners and irritate a lot of people around the country including the cities themselves to host us and make sure we listen to what we had to listen to uh, and likewise to all uh, my fellow commissioners as Ben said uh, everybody has given up their, their, their time voluntarily uh, and uh, had to give up quite a bit of sweat in the process too and it's been a, 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 a fun uh, thing for us to do but I must also thank all of our, our sponsors uh, but also uh, lastly uh, I'd like to say thanks to all the people in our great uh, cities uh, I've traveled around uh, urban Britain more in the past 12 months than I've probably ever done before other than watching a certain football team occasionally uh, and it's been in itself a, a deeply uh, rewarding uh, process to do. So let me just give you a, a, a few sort of big sound bites about, about this uh, fantastic report which uh, is the culmination of our thoughts. And Ben touched on the, the most important thing at the start. <clears throat> uh, when I was stood here a year ago, uh, I articulated the case that at least as chair we would look at these issues, or I would especially, from a macroeconomic perspective. And we would try to think of interventions X, Y, and Z, that if we could agree on them to recommend them, and if we believed they could be implemented, uh, we would only come up with ones that we thought would boost the national growth potential of the UK. 
One of the uh, many important things that we have in the report is an illustrative example of what we think we have managed to pull off uh, through the process. And we show that if the metro areas outside of London were to boost or choose to be allowed, supported to boost their game, uh, to get their GVA or their gross value added to the average performance, uh, we show very mecha mechanistically that that would uh, result in a, an additional $60 billion of real GDP, which I wish I would have worked out before I put it in the report, actually translates into 0.2% for the uh, rate of GDP growth for the country between now and 2030. So in principle, satisfying exactly uh, what we set out to do in the first place. We do not, I hastily add, pinpoint how each of the things we've come up with will achieve that, uh, but linked to what Lord Heseltine says, that sort of depends on others now that our commission is coming to an end to take up uh, the mantle about some of the ideas and hopefully uh, delivering that. Um, and, and, and let me now give you a, a, a brief, uh, for the next 10 minutes or so, uh, highlight of the things that I, that I personally believe are so important uh, that are contained in detail in this report. And again, I'll start from uh, some simple observations that inspired me from the start. Uh, and there's kind of four. First of all, if you look at global cities, the UK currently has one, London, that barely registers as being big and important. And as we've shown in our initial documents, and it's discussed again here, uh, global economic growth in the most important places is concentrated around the most important urban centers. So there's fact number one. Fact number two uh, is that three of the four largest economies in the world that obviously I've spent a huge amount of my professional life studying, uh, the United States, Germany and China are all completely different except for the fact they're all very big and they are very decentralized. The UK is unique almost in being so centralized compared to any other uh, certainly developed economies and many uh, emerging economies too. So that's observation number two. Uh, the third observation, uh, and I'm going to come back and touch on this, we knew uh, that during the 12 months we were going to be doing this that the Scottish referendum would be hanging around uh, the whole time that we were doing it and we knew then uh, that that referendum would be a few weeks before we finish. So unlike for others, uh, it's, this is not an issue uh, that is important simply because of the Scottish referendum. And I want to come back and touch on that. Uh, and, and topic number four is that the, uh, a number of aspects of our rich uh, country in the UK uh, that are actually still very diverse. And a, and a key feature of some of the things we recommended is to actually low-hanging fruit, I think I heard somebody touch on, is to, is, to, is to piggyback on some of those things to see if they can be enabler, uh, particularly our universities, uh, to, to do things to, to achieve the goal that we set. So that's sort of the simple observations. And so from that, uh, let me uh, highlight the, the key things that I, I, I will touch on. And there's more detail on these and other things in our reports. Uh, and again, I want to emphasize, as we did then and have done repeatedly, none of our ideas are supposed to be done at London's expense. And indeed, linked to the ones that Lord Heseltine said that we think the Chancellor has stolen from us, uh, which we're very happy that he has done, uh, essentially mimicking uh, some of the things that are so brilliant about London, in particular its sheer number of people and size. So uh, what has become known uh, as One North, which I'm sure Richard, you may touch on, Richard Lees from Manchester, is at the heart of uh, a response from northern cities to the Chancellor's call for a northern powerhouse, and I think what he christened HS3. Our uh, own uh, nuanced angle on it is what we call Northern Oyster. And I believe some of the staff just showing as we walked in here, we've, unfortunately we didn't get it mocked up in time. We have, we have a, a copy of what it would look like. Uh, and we think that having the same sort of connectivity between different modes of public transport, certainly much faster, especially the train network, 
than the one that it was otherwise proposed before we existed, uh, will do wonders for bringing around some of the agglomeration benefits that those cities that I sort of dine out on an awful acronym, Manchef Leedspool, uh, could do for that part of the world and areas close to them uh, that London has. Similarly, uh, the other thing that Lord Hesseltine touched on uh, about uh, our great diverse uh, universities, many of which are in the north but also elsewhere, the Chancellor's call for them to come up with uh, an answer to the Crick Institutes is something we uh, also recommended and completely endorse and are very eager to still help get done, even though I guess at uh, another hour from now we will sort of cease to exist. Uh, and importantly, in, in, in the emotion uh, as well as the objective focus on the topic of devolution, those are things that should happen and can happen that don't actually require uh, devolution. And our report is not just about uh, devolution of powers. It is, in my judgment, a necessity, but not sufficient to delivering uh, what our initial uh, and ultimate objective is, which is to raise the country's trend growth rate. Let me also say in that regard uh, that it is not just about, uh, in terms of selecting the cities, and I'm going to touch on this a bit more now, just you, uh, English cities. Uh, of the 15 metro areas we defined, it does include Glasgow, linked to Lord Hesseltine's points, uh, a huge uh, urban driver of life in Scotland. We just, I just spent a number of days up there and was hugely impressed by what I observed and heard. It includes Cardiff and it includes uh, Belfast. Which takes me to the contentious issue about those we didn't look at. Uh, we deliberately concentrated on those 15 metro areas because we wanted to achieve the goal of coming up with ideas that would boost the national growth rates. That is the only reason why we did it. We have heard quite rightly and repeatedly uh, from many people in smaller uh, cities and towns and other areas as to why not us. And as I joked at an LGA meeting on Monday, but actually the more I think about it, I'm in it quite seriously. If we were to have another life or to go on, or, or some of the members of, of our commission might want to do that anyhow, if they haven't got other things to do, it would be very interesting to look at uh, the case of some of these cities. I had a very interesting uh, meeting with the people from Hull uh, just uh, two weeks ago in this building. Uh, who articulated their stress and irritation with me that they weren't considered. Uh, but uh, uh, I, in my non-diplomatic way as usual, I said, well, if you kind of thought about getting yourselves together as a combined authority with the broader area, maybe we should and would have done. Uh, similarly to Marcos Arrest, I'm not sure if he's here from Peterborough, has to get the single biggest award for being the one from a small city that has pestered us the most. <laughs> And I really admire what he has done in making us listen to him because he's had some very important points and there are many, many others. So when it comes, so I've touched on the two key areas that are at the center of things that don't really involve a lot of devolution of, of, of powers to local areas, but they involve a lot of cooperation from people from different cities outside of London. And frankly, in itself, it has been really fun for us to observe and experience and share in everybody having to get out of the comfort zone uh, to come up with the uh, specific uh, commercial responses to make those things real. And I feel as I stand here, they are in the works uh, and I'm pretty sure that the members of the current coalition, if they were to remain in place, would see it on themselves to want to deliver on both those things and I suspect we will get more announcements about both of those either before or in the autumn statements. On, and so to finish with on the topic of devolution, a few uh, very quick comments. First of all, uh, we do believe, and um, we learned this early on, that on the topic of skills, that is something that can be devolved to many places. Uh, and amongst the, the, the many other topics we've looked at, that is one that seems to us in particularly clear that it is the local communities where people have to deal every day with the immense challenges of where there are not enough skilled people and not enough people with opportunities that has the strongest case for the earliest of devolution to many parts of the country. 
On the uh, broader, uh, highly sensitive uh, and emotional issues about devolution to where and what, I touched on this earlier. <clears throat> I think there is a danger that so many people are only thinking about this in terms of the Scottish referendum. We ourselves were thinking about it all the time before the actual referendum, maybe influenced by the fact that that was coming, uh, but those uh, metro areas and others that now want to push to get more responsibility, I think you have got to be more ambitious than thinking you just deserve it because Scotland is getting something itself. You have got to articulate the case as to why it is worth, as Lord Heseltine himself articulated, uh, central government wanting to take the risk of giving you that responsibility which you have to demonstrate you have got. Takes me to a second quite contentious part of the report. We make it clear that even within the 15 metro areas today, we don't think they are all ready for a lot of powers and in fact, probably all of them need to do something more in order be, to be ready to take a lot. And I touch on in the forward the ones that I think might be closer than others, but that isn't a really critical part. That is for people in those cities and metro areas to prove uh, to the policymakers rather than just us uh, a pine on it. Um, but my impression, uh, quite confidently, that the door has been opened by us and others and by the uh, public comments made already by the <laughs> Chancellor, so this is the moment to do that. We do make it clear that all the things specifically we are talking about should be open to at least those 15 metro areas and maybe through time others as well. And very lastly and very importantly, linked to, again to something that Lord Heseltine said uh, and really came to our minds in our own intense discussions in the past few weeks, we have laid out a timetable in which we recommend an independent committee uh, presides over running in parallel to the Hague Smith Commission that itself by January uh, holds to account our national policymakers who have said they want to devolve these powers and so that there is no loss of momentum as a result of ceasing to exist, uh, which in itself would also outline the sorts of things that we and others have recommended uh, in order for uh, metro areas and others to be responsible and capable of dealing with that new responsibility and power uh, when it comes along. Um, I'm going to finish there but with a final comment. A number of people uh, ask us, what is it we have brought new that others before us have not done? Uh, and in the rather chaotic morning I've had leading up to this, I did manage to catch a couple of emails from some very other important people that have existed in uh, the, the case and the space for cities for a long time. Alan Harding from the Heseltine Institute himself sent me a very uh, kind email saying that we seem to have done something to have uh, brought up this moment of when the time is, is now uh, and trying to uh, encourage that a lot of the things we're talking about uh, will not uh, disappear because of our ending. And then uh, the guys at IPP, uh, IPPP have written a very interesting blog uh, in which they highlight, of course, their own thinking uh, in this space for a long time, but have answered themselves as to what they think we have done new, and that is we have been bolder and riskier in their judgments. Uh, it's very nice to see them say that because that's what we feel we've done, and linked to what I've just said, we want to make sure that those that have opined on this topic during the past 12 months are held to account uh, and allow these very exciting things which Lord Heseltine outlined must happen uh, to actually this time must happen. So thank you very much. Thanks, Jim. Um, I'm now going to ask uh, Sir Richard Lees um, to respond on behalf of... Um, the LGA City Regions Board, um, Manchester, the core cities. One Should North, tell one you North Rail North. Uh, the, uh, the, the one, the one <laughs> problem with the mock-up of the Northern, the Northern Oyster Car, which would have pleased you, is it's sky blue in colour. Uh, <laughs> that, so that, the, that's why it wasn't ready for this morning. <laughs> well, 
It's, it's probably one of the few criticisms I was going to make of the uh, uh, report, because Oyster, Oyster Card is really uh, old, old technology now. We, 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 we really need to be moving on to uh, the idea of smart, smart ticketing and, and multimodal ticketing. So it's, uh, it, it's a card, it's your own uh, charge card, it's your smart, your smartphone, a number of ways of being able to uh, use that. Apart from that, I, in case I forget later on, I, I do want to welcome uh, the report, and I do want to think, thank Jim, Charlotte, and the, all of the Commission uh, for producing uh, the report. I think uh, Michael took us back to I think, 1981 and uh, Toxteth. The core cities have been working on this agenda since 1999, not quite as, uh, as, as long, but I think as Jim just said uh, then in his, uh, as he was closing, the time is now. It's things that we've been working for and towards for a long time need to be happening and they need to be happening uh, in the next, or starting to happen in the next 12 12 months. Uh, wh why, why is that? And I think the report demonstrates uh, that. It is uh, cities that uh, drive growth. It's not that all the growth occurs uh, there. They are the drivers of uh, growth, but uh, the system isn't working. Our cities are underperforming. They're certainly underperforming in, in comparison to the, uh, the best in class in uh, Europe and other parts of, of the world. And uh, the conclusion that leads to is that we basically are at risk of losing, uh, according to the Commission, at, at least £79 billion worth of growth out of our economy. If you add all the other places that aren't within the 15 metro area, that amount uh, that grows and be becomes even more uh, significant. And the report sets out examples of why it doesn't work, the skills mismatch. Uh, a nationalised uh, skills system can't produce the skilled workers that we need for, for economic uh, growth. The structural unemployment programme, the work programme, isn't working with those people who are furthest away from the uh, labour market. Uh, a health system that should be supporting people to be able to stay in work does almost exactly the uh, opposite uh, uh, from that. It promotes de dependency rather than independence. The system isn't, isn't working, and it's not working within a very difficult context, a context of what every, everybody, I think, in Whitehall calls austerity, what all the rest of us call cuts. In that context, the system isn't, isn't working. And where I think this report leads us uh, to is uh, not an ask of government, but an offer to government. It's an offer to government that says that your centralised, one-size-fits-all, siloed systems are broke, and our offer is to you is that we can fix them. And we can fix them by doing things at the right spatial level. It is an, in, an offer of an integrated approach, an offer that probably for the first time ever allows us to start uniting economic and uh, social policy. So not only do we uh, get accelerated growth, not only do we get accelerated job creation, we also have the tools to make sure that local people can benefit from that job creation, that we reduce dependency, we create more independent people, more independent uh, families. Now, what does the offer require to be able to do that? Because there are two sides to this, and uh, I think it's been very clear with both Michael and, and Jim that government needs to change, and government needs to change fairly fundamentally. Uh, but local places, local government needs to change uh, as well in order to be able to uh, carry out this uh, offer. One of the things it requires is scale. Uh, it requires uh, councils working together uh, at the level of the right economic uh, geography. And it's, uh, uh, Michael referred to his uh, No Stone uh, Unturned uh, report, which I think made it quite clear that that needs to be the, uh, the functional economic uh, area, and that local enterprise partnerships need to be coterminous with those combinations of local authorities operating in that right economic uh, geography. Um, as well as operating at the right, the right scale, we also need strong, transparent and accountable uh, governance. And uh, uh, to a large extent, the uh, creation of combined authorities, starting with the Greater Manchester Combined Authority, now with four others, but a lot of other places up and down the country now looking at establishing combined authorities or, or, or similar, gives us an element of that strong, transparent and accountable governance. But even we in Greater Manchester, who've now been in existence for three and a half years, don't think we're quite yet fit for purpose to take on the level of powers that uh, uh, we want. And we're reviewing 
reviewing our governance structures in order to give ourselves the capacity, not for what we do now, but for what we want to do uh, in, in the future. And that's both political capacity and uh, executive capacity. Although I have, have to say, um, as it's talked about a lot, that uh, one of the things we're quite clear about is that a London-style mayor is not an approach we're, we're, we're going to take. And uh, uh, there, is re there is a very clear re reason for that. What London has is two tiers. Uh, two tiers can't give you the integration that we're talking about between social and economic <coughs> policy. I think the, the London system, I don't think it's replicated anywhere else in the world. So why we would re replicate it in Greater Manchester is utterly, be, uh, utterly beyond me. What we do need is a one-tier system uh, that builds on, uh, builds on what we've already done within the combined authority, but we are looking at that within that combined authority having an element of direct election as well as indirect election to give us the uh, strength of governance we need. Local government now accepts generally that rather than the old way of going at the, the lowest common denominator, going at the speed of the slowest, we now need to go at the speed of the, the fastest. And if we go at the speed of the fastest, it incentivizes all other places to do the same, to, uh, to, uh, to catch up. And I think, I think that has been demonstrated in practice. I think we're also clear that it doesn't have to be the same everywhere. Places are different. If, if you do the same thing, in, and this is what's wrong with national programmes. If you do the same thing in different places, you get different outcomes. You don't get the same outcomes by doing the same thing uh, everywhere. You need a differential approach. And uh, indeed, one of the concerns about uh, postcode lottery, that as long as you become outcome driven rather than programme uh, driven, then by doing different things in different places, then you, you are capable of, of delivering the sort of uh, common outcomes that, again, Michael quite rightly said that any national government is, is going to require in the big questions. Uh, the report talks about fiscal devolution, and I think fiscal devolution uh, is a necessary road to go down. But fiscal devolution, I think, as CLG Select Committee report earlier this year uh, demonstrated, is not straightforward. Proportionality, equalisation, redistribution are all big issues within fiscal uh, uh, de devolution. Uh, Devolution of power and responsibilities is a lot, a lot easier. Uh, the Secretary of State for uh, Biz could devolve skills tomorrow if he so, so wish. It doesn't require any legislation, uh, it doesn't require any, anything new. And what we need to do is to have a timetable, which I think is set out here, that allows those things that can be devolved quickly to be devolved, devolved quickly and not using the more difficult issues around, uh, such as fiscal devolution, to slow down that devolution of power and responsibilities. Although even there, I would caveat that, and again, it's something that's quite clear within the report, is that if cities have the tools to to boost their, uh, boost their economic performance. If they boost their economic performance, then whether it's through TIF-type schemes or earn back type schemes, they ought to be able to capture some of that benefit to reinvest back into uh, th their city regions. A uh, couple of things to uh, finish off with. Uh, the question of the uh, devolved administrations, which uh, both Jim and Michael have, uh, have touched upon, uh, probably uh, if there is one country more centralised than England, it's probably Scotland. Um, uh, although Albania apparently is more centralised than both of, uh, both of those, those places, but that's not really a model we want to uh, uh, follow. And the reason that uh, uh, Cardiff and Glasgow have both joined the core cities group is, is that they face exactly the same issues and their constraints on their ability to, to boost, boost their, their growth. So uh, although it might be a matter for the Welsh Assembly or the Scottish Parliament, we ought to be making uh, clear that these arguments apply in Scotland and Wales and Northern Ireland just as much as they do in, in England. I think it's a very important recognition. Uh, Next to the last, last thing, and uh, Jim said I might touch on uh, One North, the Northern Powerhouse, and so on. I've heard Jim say a couple of times in, in other settings that the uh, best reports are the ones that are already being implemented by the time you get to uh, uh, publish them, and that's probably a, a case in point, point around the... Uh, 
the northern powerhouse in that the northern cities have done two things actually. One is One North, which is we have developed an infrastructure investment plan for uh, the north and if that is successfully implemented it would give the northern cities uh, the sort of connectivity that would allow us to benefit from agglomeration uh, effects. It would produce that single labour market ar around the Leeds Manchester access including cities beyond within that as, uh, within that as well. So Hull, Newcastle, Teesport, uh, Liverpool would all be part of uh, that, that con concept. But as well as an inv uh, investment plan, we also want to run the stuff uh, as well. And through uh, Rail North, we've put together an organisation that is aiming uh, ultimately to take over responsibility of running both uh, the Northern Rail franchise and the Transpennine franchise. And can I say that we're getting to the final stages of the specification for those two franchises, working uh, very well with. Uh, the Department for Transport on this. Uh, one of the things we haven't got quite got to yet, but it is in the work programme, is a smart ticketing system for the Northern Rail and Transpennine uh, franchises. So uh, that is certainly something that is, is something we're, we're looking at. Uh, so, last two things. Uh, I said that uh, transport was going to be the next to the last. Uh, first of all, I, one of the things we're doing here is, is changing a concept of how we live in uh, in this country. Uh, historically, uh, Britain has operated almost on the notion of uh, rural good, urban bad. Uh, I think we've changed that paradigm quite radically over the last decade or so, and that city life in particular is now seen as, as good. And I think that uh, change of, is actually necessary in order to be able to underpin uh, the sort of future we want. It's not just about uh, economics, it's not just about uh, social programmes, it's also about culture uh, as well, the way we understand how, how we live. And the very last thing, uh, and this echoes where uh, Jim finished with the timetable and the, pro, uh, the, the process. I think it's incumbent upon us as uh, cities uh, not to wait uh, for government to develop a timetable uh, for this because uh, that's asking for the turkeys to uh, uh, d d uh, make the timetable for their Christmas. Um, <laughs> Uh, Christmas might not come very quickly if, if that's happened. I think it's incumbent on us as cities to deliver that action plan to government as part of our offer to them. Say, so, look, we've got solutions for you. This is the timescale on which we can de deliver these solutions. And if we do all of that, uh, if government is prepared to grasp that the time is uh, now, uh, we, not only will we have uh, better cities, we will have a better country as well. Thank you, Richard. Can I ask uh, Amanda Clack, Jules Pipe and Tom Reardon to join me up here, please? So we've heard from uh, Lord Heseltine the, the, the broad political challenge. Um, Jim set out um, the findings of the report uh, and Richard has responded uh, and set out what cities are already doing. Um, I think firstly we'd like to hear from you, Amanda, to get your perspective um, from a business perspective and from a development perspective about what you think of this report and does it chime with your experience? Thanks very much. Um, on behalf of the RICS, the eminent body in land, property and construction, I have to say I'm absolutely delighted to be here today at the launch of this report and would also like to congratulate the City Growth Commission for really setting out what is a panoramic vision for our cities here in the UK so that they can compete very much on the global stage alongside London. These proposals will define the debate, and I think as Lord Heseltine said, um, it's about over the devolution of powers and funding in England during the next Parliament. Um, how the proposed economic growth is then achieved is very much then down onto the individual cities, the LEPs, enterprise zones and funding streams, and how these really start to come together to respond to that challenge. These are areas that the RICS has been looking at recently. Indeed, we published our property and politics paper, which we took through the recent party conferences, in terms of informing the next government 
on uh, an approach to development which goes beyond local. Um, not a return to the regional development agencies, but recognition that there really is a strategic planning level which whole, re whole region should actually encompass. And it's clear that we really need to rebalance the economy. That means creating a strong and globally competitive system of cities, um, particularly across the North and Midlands and also from east to west. Um, indeed, I think it's true that we do need better transport and communication networks in terms of infrastructure investment here in the UK. And cities need genuine control in setting those priorities that meet their needs at a localised level. What is also clear is that we need strong leadership in locational investment to provide robust, accountable governance, also to really drive through the growth and the provision of more housing. This is about delivery of development after we have the powers and funding in place. Of course, the next step is very much about how do civic leaders really take that development delivery unit, um, as RICS has suggested, where economic and planning powers are effectively pooled. So we very much welcome this report on behalf of RICS and on behalf of our members in the built environment to work with government with city leaders and indeed with city metros to continue the debate and has been said develop the action plan and articulate the case and really unleash the potential of our cities here in the UK. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Jules, you're, you're Chair of London Councils and, and Mayor of Hackney. One of, one of the, uh, the pieces of work that, that sort of underpinned our commission was the London Finance Commission um, that uh, Tony Travers chaired and that, that um, was set up to look at um, fiscal devolution in London. And some of the recommendations we um, set out are clearly recommendations that reflect the work that was done in that commission and think about how they could be applied not only in London but uh, across Britain. And we've also, you know, in the course of that, reflected on some of the challenges that also face London um, about, as Richard was saying, about, about integrating reform across London. Um, and about you know, the potential for city deals for London and so on. So it'd be interesting to get your perspective on that. Yes, well, um, first, <clears throat> first I'd like to say it was, it's an excellent piece of work, uh, but not just sort of uh, to sit on a shelf uh, and, and be applauded. Um, I think it really does help push the agenda on. And as chair of one of the organisations that was a co-sponsor um, of that, that's uh, very important to us. Um, it probably surprised some people when we came forward to want to sponsor mm. this. Um, uh, this, this piece of work. I mean, I think there's a tradition that, um, you know, London moans about the net export of taxes to the other parts of the economy. Um, and obviously that's absolutely balanced, if not more so, than uh, uh, elsewhere complaining that London sucks up all the investment into big infrastructure projects, taking all that, 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 that tax that it raises uh, from the growth that happens here. But actually there's, a, I think, a perfect alignment between um, ourselves uh, and Richard in Manchester um, and the other core cities uh, across the country. And I think it is replicable, uh, as has been said today, across the other areas of the country, um, that, uh, that what, is, 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 um, uh, what is contained in this report and what's been in the, in the Travers um, Finance Commission report um, works uh, for the whole country and will work in, 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 in localities. Um, so all cities and all other metro localities uh, would, would benefit from this. We have a mutual interest in, in each other's uh, success, getting greater devolution, both fiscal, but also uh, public service reform, because it does go uh, uh, much further than just um, the property taxes uh, issue. Um, we rightly focus on how vital it is for England, uh, England cities to be empowered, to integrate public services uh, properly, a met better managed demand in a time um, of austerity, focus on really cost effective <coughs> prevention uh, of social problems, rather than as we've always been doing, dealing with the expensive consequences um, of, of failure and we can join up services far more effectively at the locality as we've heard from various speakers today uh, than just in, in, in position um, from the top. I, I would just like to mention kind of London specific element of, of, of this package. Um, it's, it's really key um, for me to say here that we strongly believe that London, um, in, uh, the devolution does not in London stop at City Hall. Um, there are far too many people who think that devolution has been done in London um, and, so why, and so again, why should London have an interest in, in this debate? Um, but uh, it has to move on. 
um, and has to move on in, in the ways that have been um, discussed uh, today. I mean, the, uh, I mean, if I can give one, one example, the London Growth Deal that we agreed in, in July provides a pilot programme in which eight central uh, London boroughs are working with London councils, the Cabinet Office, uh, the Treasury, the DWP, to get more localised uh, commissioning of employment support, where we can uh, really actually make a difference in the way, as we've heard mentioned today, you know, the, 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 the uh, DWP work programme cannot reach into the places uh, that, uh, that uh, we can uh, on, on a more local basis. Um, and this isn't about replacing the mayor or sidelining the mayor, it's actually working with the mayor, uh, working with the mayor collectively, working with the mayor as single boroughs, working with the mayor in collective boroughs, as, as collective groupings in the way um, that, uh, well, it almost like combined authorities. If only the legislation permitted London boroughs to form combined authorities, I assure you that a number of them would uh, form combined authorities. And as I, and I say again, that is not to sideline the mayor, it is to work with the mayor um, on the programmes that London needs to see. And we've seen this already before um, uh, with uh, the growth boroughs in East London during the Olympics, um, when six boroughs came together, worked as one on many issues that formerly would have been uh, opera, uh, delivered higher up or individually as boroughs. Instead, it was the mayor working with um, those six boroughs. And we, we have no uh, less ambition now. Um, so finally, really, I just wanted to say that, you know, across the country we've shown the potential in local government um, uh, to, to show the right kind of leadership that uh, Richard was talking about. We are best placed to know uh, the skills gaps in our localities, what, uh, um, uh, what's, what's needed, uh, uh, the skills, up, uh, the upskilling of, of residents that are needed by the employers in localities if they're going to grow. They're not going to be able to magic up. The, these people, but we, we, can, we can help provide them trained and ready to work. Um, and cities and localities, um, within our cities, they are best placed to bring those services together, um, as, as I've said. And I think this report really does recognise that case and it makes a strong argument for reform. So we're very grateful uh, for all that work. Um, I just want to say one quick thing, uh, just uh, uh, in response to what Lord Heseltine said, and I agreed. Um, uh, with with all, all, all that he said, and he, uh, he rightly identifies uh, one of the two things that I think are, are the key blockages uh, to this uh, agenda. Um, he talked about the democratic mandate of a government um, uh, to uh, get selected with its programme. Absolutely right. The trouble is that there are too many politicians uh, who see this as a threat to that. Too many senior politicians who think devolution is a threat to them delivering their mandate. Devolution is a way to deliver their mandate because Governments of any sort want greater employment. They want growth. This is a way to deliver that mandate. And it's, we've got to change the mindset of many politicians who think actually it, it, it's a blockage and it will stop and people are just will, will be wanting to opt out uh, of the national agenda. So it is absolutely about outcomes. It's not about inputs, measuring outputs um, and an imposition of something that, because it worked in Ambridge, is going to then be imposed across the board and work in Hackney, and it doesn't. And the second thing there is uh, that, 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 that was touched on again, um, uh, by also Richard, about accountability. Yes, local government and groupings of boroughs, uh, combined authorities, have to um, uh, in, in, uh, work on, on accountab accountability mechanisms um, that, um, that are suitable for you know, expenditure uh, of money from the public purse. But equally, ministers and the media have to get beyond this idea that a failure out in Ambridge or some other far-flung part of the country, the accountability, the accountability mechanisms can only be through the PAC and the Today programme. <laughs> we have to move on. And actually, when there is a failure, whether it's in Manchester or Hackney, Richard and I would expect to be held to account. And that's why we stand for election to deliver outcomes and be held to account on how they are delivered. We don't want to hide behind ministers making excuses about the failure of a national programme. We want to be held account, hopefully for the successes of locally designed and locally delivered programmes. Thank you. Thank you, Jules. And finally, um, I'd like to introduce Tom Reardon, and, uh, who's Chief Executive of uh, Leeds City Council. And one of the things I'd like you to reflect on is Again, something that, that um, Lord Heseltine said, because I think this point about the relationship between local government and central government, and also the maturity of the relationships in local government with business communities and across the political spectrum is really important. 
And if I reflect on my own kind of experience, I went to Liverpool a year after Lord Heseltine did and but, uh, to go to university. And by the time I left, the problem wasn't that there wasn't someone in charge. The problem was there was someone in charge, and he was called Derek Hatton, uh, even though he was only the deputy leader of the council. Um, and what you see in local government now is, is a very, very different uh, entity. Um, and I think what you've seen demonstrated in a lot of the metros we've talked to, and I know that Tom has you know, done a lot of work with uh, Keith Wakefield and others ab about this, is binding in across the whole metro areas the um, d different socio-economic interests from the, from the inner cities and the outer areas, but also politically uh, across those areas and with the business community as well. And it'd be interesting to sort of reflect a bit on that and on the work that I know that you've been doing on that topic. Yeah, thank you. I, I just commend, um, add my um, praise to the to the report. I think it's a quite a landmark report actually, and I think it it's, it takes the debate on a, a level, in particularly looking at things through a, an investment prism, a, you know, an economic, a macroeconomic um, perspective. Um, it brings out new issues like digital and data, which are fundamental to the success in the in the new economy of any place. It brings out new ideas around graduates and how you get this talent pool to not think that they've got to leave our places and come to London to get on, or worse, leave our places and, um, and go abroad um, to get on. Not that we want to build walls around um, where, where we live and work. And it, it takes us on in terms of fiscal devolution as well. I think it makes some very sensible um, comments that can be delivered quickly around business rates and council tax and um, removing ring fences and putting long-term stuff in place. So all of that, I think, is, is great, and I just wanted to say that at the start. But to come on to your, your, your question, Ben, I, I would make three points. First one is, I've worked in Whitehall. Um, I've, uh, I've worked in local government. I've worked at a regional level as well. And you cannot um, truly understand the geographic differences of the country from an office in Whitehall, where you're often put in a policy job that um, you are moved around from year to year in, um, and you're formulating policy for the whole of the country. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't work. We can't run Leeds from the Civic Hall, let alone running um, parts of Leeds from Whitehall. So somehow the culture change that's got to take place in Whitehall has got to happen, and it's got to happen in pl uh, at pace. The values of the civil service were put together um, when Viscount Folkestone and Lord Romney were probably thinking about setting up this place. And if you read them now, they haven't modernised. They haven't. They, they are great in, in principle, and we want to keep the good things about Whitehall, like its integrity and like its um, its impartiality. But it's got to it's got to let go, and it's got to decentralise. And to do that, we've got to have changes to the way finances are run um, and you've got to, the only way to do that is genuine devolution down so I think to, to, to get that whole place approach we've got to um, change Whitehall and I'm pleased that the the report covers that second point is on governance everybody does tend to obsess about governance so the media will are already you know jumping on the issue of Metro Mayor and that's the thing that everybody's debating but I think as Sir Richard very um, clearly set out, actually places are different and you've got to let places decide what's right for them with the caveat that's set by, I think quite cleverly in the report, that you've got to have um, visible leadership, you've got to have clear direct, um, a direct link if you like to, to, to that leadership and the population and I think we've got to have some ability to do that ourselves. Just to give you one example, Leeds has it is the third biggest city in the country in terms of um, council area. It has a three quarters of a million people. Um, that's about a quarter of a million less than Birmingham. But we're twice the geographic size of Birmingham. And that's just Leeds. And then you spread out into our different um, other areas in our city region. And it's, there's a lot of green space in between us. The Greater Manchester area is, is more urbanised and it's closer... Um, together if you like and it's more of a single place so even Leeds and Manchester who are seen as maybe similar have got to think differently about how we develop and how we do things and how we run 
um, our systems. So, so that's the, sec the, the second point um, about that difference being respected. Um, and, you know, I think we can come up with new models that can make that work. And the final point I would make is this, just to reiterate, let's move at the pace of the fastest um, and not to the, not, not the slowest, but not to the detriment of others. We're always put in this league table of, you know, who's ahead of the game. Everyone assumes London's first and then who's next. And um, we've all, we're all, you know, almost competing in every policy debate. Let's do this in a way that shows that actually there is a place for every part of the country to, to move forward to get better. But some are going to have to go first to make that happen. And um, I, I just finish on the point Jules made, which actually cities and metro areas are the best delivery mechanism for sorting out what the country needs that the Treasury's got. And I think that's starting to, um, that penny is starting to drop. Okay, thanks very much. Well, you've heard a lot, and I think we ought to give you the opportunity to ask some questions. Um, so, can I see who would like to ask a question? Yeah. And maybe what I suggest is we take two or three questions together rather than individually, and that will give more people a chance to come in. So, Tofield, uh, fellow. Uh, how does this report relate to another key important future issue, which is the creation of a low carbon economy? I hear a lot about GDP but there's very little in it that I've skimmed on sustainability, low carbon, and the growth of the new industries which will support that. Okay. Who else would like to come in? Hello. My name is Adam Feinberg. I'm an advisor on economic development and public services. I'd like to congratulate Ben and others on this very good report. Um, over the years, we've seen a lot of work the Northern Way. We've seen a referendum in the Northeast. Um, and we haven't seen much give and change. Um, we've also got a, a system of governance working with boroughs, local authorities, unitary authorities, where most public expenditure, most public services are delivered. I absolutely agree that there's a role for larger conurbations, joint areas, local authority areas, to deliver on the strategic uh, stuff that adds to GDP. Um, but I'm very concerned, as Sir Richard Lisa suggested, that the larger areas should have oversight and uh, responsibility for, for example, social policy. Um, we've had 15 years of public service reform, yet we've got a very dysfunctional public service system and it's not doing very much for people. By taking uh, delivery of public services away from local authority areas and ranking them up to the regional level, we're taking them further away from communities, local authorities and individuals. Okay, thanks very much. And over there. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Stefanie Bolzen, I'm the UK correspondent for the German newspaper Die Welt, so I'm very intrigued by this uh, report. Um, to me as a German, federalism and power of local and regional communities comes as something really natural. So I wonder if you, uh, if you have really also looked into the question of a mentality change. So is the people really in favour of this? Because it's something historical as well. Hmm. Interesting. One more question. And then we'll come back on this. Yep. Brian Kilkelly, uh, Chief Executive of World Cities Network. <clears throat> My question relates to the low carbon economy um, point, which is that if we're seeing, you know, four degrees of temperature rise over the next sort of you know, 50 years, potentially in the UK, uh, the need for flexibility and adaptability at a local level is going to increase even faster. So uh, I don't know whether the report sort of touches on this in terms of, from a GDP growth point of view, it's not only about growing, but it's also about protecting and avoiding, uh, you know, shrinking and damage by not being able to respond fast enough to, uh, to the changes, the ma these big macroeconomic issues. So uh, how's that taken account of? Okay, thanks very much. Right, who would like to come back on any of those? Uh, Jules, I know, wanted to come back on the public service point, is that right? Uh, yes, I mean, I, I, I think anyone who's been closely involved with this agenda, myself, Richard, would be absolutely horrified at the idea of it being presented as a taking up of power. Absolutely not. This is actually about a bringing down of power that's currently exercised in, in Whitehall departments and bringing it down closer to localities. And, uh, and even my, my vision of, of how London would work, for example, uh, as an example, um, would be that although groupings of boroughs might be required to... Um, uh, 
take, take greater control of, say, an element of the, the work program, it would still be delivered through boroughs. So there would be no, you know, it would be further dispersed through that, and that would be that mechanism. Okay. Um, anyone else want to come back on those points? Do you want to come back to Well, him? I guess there was uh, two, at least two of the questions were specifically asked about what uh, the report both I had essentially the same questions about low carbon e economy. Um, my answer is really as follows that um, it, we have thought about uh, the broad uh, issues uh, related to um, low carbon e economies but in the context of, of other issues and with the basis of economic growth. Uh, when I hear that kind of question in this setting, it, it's not a million miles away from when that same question is put to China and India in, in a global context, something I spent a large part of my life in about their own role in, in the global challenge. Uh, and that it's, it's easy for, for us to say, you guys have got to do X, Y, and Z because we've had enough of the pollution that we've actually led the world to contributing. And these guys say, yeah, but it's important, but there's a lot of other things that are important, including making sure all our people get out of poverty. Uh, so I say that because that's the sort of context, I think, how we've approached it. Um, and we, ha we heard quite a bit about it in our evidence sessions around the country, some more than others, actually. I can think of, uh, in particular, when we were in Bristol, uh, the hearing we had there, this was a major uh, feature of how the people that uh, currently run uh, Bristol City think as being important. Um, less so uh, in some other parts of, of the world uh, at the other end of the spectrum and, and, and of relevance in, in other sensitivities right now. Uh, in the Northeast, uh, we heard that actually their biggest dilemma is they don't have enough people. And the last thing they want to do is stop immigrants. They want to actually encourage them to come from uh, the rest of the world and there. So, Something like that wouldn't feature so much, but uh, my, my ultimate answer is in the context of, of how actually Nick Stern and his colleagues recently wrote about this in a global sense. The right way for, I would have thought, but it's up in the spirit of what this is all about, it's up to the local areas themselves, but I would have thought the right way to do it is to come up with the cutting edge technologies that contribute to economic growth with reference to the kind of things both questions uh, raised. Um, the only other th thing I, I can't resist saying about the, the very interesting question about Germany, two things. First of all, in how I approach this, I, 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 as I said earlier, uh, again reflecting my past experiences, I, I'm more than aware of the success of Germany in that regard. And specifically, and I think we showed this as an example in our, in our first report on defining places, the remarkable change in Hamburg. Uh, that when I was growing up as a lad, so to speak, and studied economic geography, Hamburg was regarded as a write-off. Uh, and today, I think we focused on Hamburg and Boston as two cities that are, are so full of vibrancy and energy and influences on thinking about things. But the second part of your question, my second point, is this, uh, you know, is it a natural thing that people want to do? And I answer you in the spirit of two things. That one of the things that we've, and I touched on this, that we've wanted to encourage is to encourage stroke force people in uh, parts of the country, including in cities and their leaders, to, to get out of the comfort zone. Uh, because unless they, they will and can, this agenda won't uh, be pursued. Because you, at the end of the day, you've got to persuade national policymakers. I, I will never forget when I first uttered the phrase manpool at a hearing in Manchester, and people thought I was completely nuts, uh, especially coming from somebody that has opined on aspects about that when it comes to football. But uh, you know, if you want to have a better say and a better future for all the people that at the end of the day you're looking at in your area, you've got you to think of things a bit differently. And as you imply with that question, people in our different cities that have proud uh, uh, histories and, and, and want to compete against each other, they've got to think a bit differently about aspects of this. And I, I'll finish off by complimenting uh, the VC of Sheffield University, who said to me uh, at one stage in this process, if, if it requires us thinking of ourselves as being a suburb of Manchester, 
to get part of a greater pie, so be it. Which is the sort of way, and I'm not saying that specifically that that's what we're su suggesting, but that's the sort of mindsets people have got to think about in order for these things to progress, in my opinion. Tom, did you want to come back? Yeah, I, I just reiterate the point about this not being about taking things up from the social level. I think that I'm, from what I know of what um, Greater Manchester are doing and certainly what we're doing in Leeds as, as well, that's certainly not the, uh, not, not the idea, but it's about using models like the, um, you know, the, the uh, we call it the Families First, the Troubled Families Framework. There's a much more effective way of running, integrating social and economic policy if we can do it at that local level, because we know that you know, the firms and the organisations and the third sector who are actually doing this on the ground, and you can do that better at this level um, rather than the, the Whitehall level. On the green issues, I, th I think I would make two points and link it back to the GVA. I think we can do it better. Green Deal, anybody's experience of the Green Deal over the last five years, um, it's been a series of stalled initiatives. Um, if we could have had that as an opportunity um, at a metro level, we could have made it work, absolutely, no doubt at all. The, um, the, we don't, we lack, what Germany has and we lack is a link between our industrial strategy um, and our spatial strategy. And if you take um, the green industries as an example, we're building some of the biggest wind farms in the world out in the North Sea, off the east coast um, of the Humber. We've got um, world leading technology um, and academia in many universities, um, nuclear in the northwest, carbon capture happening in Yorkshire. Put that together um, and you've got the next generation of uh, low carbon industries um, and you've got a win-win for the country because we have a low carbon um, energy production at the same time as green jobs. Um, so, you know, it's about looking at this and, and again giving us the opportunity to make those connections that Whitehall departments successively over many years have failed to make. Final point on mentality change, which I think is a really interesting and good point. Um, we, um, I think it partly depends which question you ask. Certainly when the people of Leeds and Bradford and Wakefield were asked if they wanted a directly elected mayor to, to replace the current city structures, they voted two to one against it a matter of two years ago. So um, that's an important point to make. But on the other hand, I think if having had the Scottish debate now, if you ask people in the north of England now, do you want more to shape your own destiny more, do you want more devolution? I think the opinion polls are coming back very differently, much more positively. I think the problem has been we've never been offered a prize that's worth taking and we haven't been offered something which is um, not a specific um, model that was dreamed up by someone else that was being imposed on us um, as an area. You want to come back on yeah, that? Yeah, I just want to come back on that point about our local, our people in this country um, up for it and in favour of it. And Tom actually began to make the point I was, I was going to make. Often the, the debate gets distorted into it's a postcode lottery and oh, not more politicians. Um, and actually, it's neither. We've made clear about the fact we already have a postcode lottery as a result of the nationalised system we have. And it's not about more politicians. It's actually about working, working together better. Um, I th and actually, what this debate really is about about jobs, growth, uh, increasing skills, housing, turning around troubled families, localising rehabilitation of offenders so it's more appropriate for the localities when they come out of prison, uh, better adult social care, making the money go further. Those are all the things that people are interested in talking about. So in a way, this really is things people are in favour of, but we just need to change the national debate. So that's, that's better realised. Okay, time for a couple of more questions. I'm going to take you because I know Jonathan, who is one of the um, staff members for the Secretariat for the Commission, will be giving us some Twitter questions. Is that right? Question via Twitter from Group Intellects, and it builds on what we've just talked about um, with, with kind of public support. How would you square the public's fear of a postcode lottery, which has come through in a YouGov poll, with the recommendations of the report today? Okay, thank you. Uh, I take them on. I'll take one over there, and then and then you, Alex. Hi, uh, Joe Gayton, uh, Department for Communities and Local Government. Um, I just wondered if the panel might elaborate more on what they think 
um, could be done with decentralisation? You know, how would it enable places, local authorities, to invest in the people as well as the places to get this extra growth? And also to comment briefly on the local enterprise partnership geographies and how that might all fit in with this uh, Manchef, Leeds pool or whatever it is. All right. And then finally, I'm afraid I've, I've only got time to take Alex uh, and also to thank Alex Jones as one of our commission advisors from the Centre for Cities. Thanks. Yeah, Alex Jones, I run the Centre for Cities and was uh, privileged to be an advisor to the commission. So with that bias admitted, I think the report has really helped move the, the debate on. I'm interested in what next. Jim touched on this. Um, certainly at the Centre for Cities, we're going to be working with cities, politicians, officials over the next nine months on the detail of how do you help cities make the most of their economic potential, as well as trying to keep this debate in the public mind. I'd be really interested in the one or two things that the panel thinks would be most important to make sure that what's set out in, in this report and, and what many cities have been arguing for, for for a number of years, how do you make that a reality given the moment that's been created by the Scottish referendum and, and the election? Okay, thanks very much. Um, right, who wants to take these questions in what order? Well, I'm just happy to quickly come back okay. on the postcode lottery. I just think Richard said it best and I think actually can be almost summated in an equation. Um, <laughs> You know, central demand for same output times different locality equals different outcome. That is what we have today. We need to do different things in different localities if we are going to achieve those national outcomes that, as I acknowledged, um, a, 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 a government with a democratic mandate um, has a right to, right to, right to expect. Love to come. I'd, I'd love to come back on, on your point, Alex, because I think, um, as was said earlier, I think you know what we've got now is a real gift and a real opportunity, and it's actually it's what we do with it. So the agenda is very much central stage, and, and the time is now, as has been said. And I think what's really important is the mindset change that's been alluded to in the room, and actually the coming together of, of, of regions and cities in terms of thinking about the whole region and what the opportunity is, and to kind of think about that in the context of the infrastructure, the whole infrastructure, the social infrastructure, the transport infrastructure, and effectively how that can really generate potential um, for that particular region. And I think it's fantastic to hear, you know, when you talk about the green carbon agenda um, and what the potential is um, around that. And certainly when you look at the World Economic Forum and sort of how they're really pushing the built environment um, globally, I think the UK has got a real opportunity to, as it is, very much leading that debate. And actually to start to think about that in terms of that regional context is really important. Okay, thanks. Tom? Yeah, I mean, on, on the um, investing in people, I think there are, there are great examples from the, the, the work that's been done so far about how we're getting twice the results of things like the youth contract at a local level than we are nationally. So I'd like to see, um, you know, the, the good practice that's happening already um, accelerated at pace. Um, I don't think the lap geographies are a, a, a deal breaker in all this. I think if, if some, something needs sorting out, I think, again, you, I would look to local areas to do that um, and, and make sure that that doesn't stand in the way. And I just strongly agree um, with the earlier comments about the other issues. We, we have a postcode lottery already. We, we just do. Um, it's just not brought out um, in, in the same way. And the, the system we need is one where we get better outcomes right across the country. We, we, we rebalance the economy across the country, and we can't do that d using the current system. Um, in, in terms of action, I, I do think some sort of parliamentary, some sort of legislation in the the first part of the new, um, the new parliament is really vital in terms of um, the lessons that I understand from other, other processes, particularly London, um, because it locks everybody in um, and it doesn't allow you to, um, to wriggle out of anything. And I, so I, I would like to see it, see it in there, but as, use the time from now until then to really drive through action on the ground at pace. So I'll just <clears throat> answer to two of the questions. The one about local authorities and, and LAPs. Uh, we specifically recommend that the skills responsibility is devolved uh, around the country, giving a bigger role to the LAPs. Um, I, <clears throat> I had a, many, many experiences of the whole process of the past 12 months and I had a very personal one recently when I was, went back to uh, Manchester and I visited the two schools I, I went to as a kid. 
one of which is in a very poor part of Manchester, uh, and uh, heard about people who were my age that I used to play football with who are no longer alive. And uh, making sure people that can, can come up with the responsibilities for the skills for the people in those kind of communities has to go to people in the local communities because it's very different there. I, we also heard when we were in the northeast of uh, um, Hitachi wanting to follow Nissan and create thousands of engineers and already they're, they're only being able to do it uh, by pinching people from Nissan. Uh, where what the region wants is both places to employ 35,000 people. The LEP, well, however constructed in that region, or the LEPs together with the combined authority, is the, is the entity that knows or should be responsible for making sure that when somebody goes back there in a few years' time, the same issue isn't on the agenda, the same as five, ten years' time when I go back to Cross Acres in Withinshaw, Manchester, the, the same evidence isn't there for the next generation. Uh, and we recommend that as a core part of things that we believe that should be devolved. Um, and then lastly, to Alex's vital question, what next? Uh, and as I, <clears throat> I haven't talked about that much, but a, a really important part of what we came to conclude in the past few weeks is we worried about that ourselves, of course, uh, and we have laid out a timetable, and I, I hope the media present here, BBC uh, and others, uh, give airing to this part of it, that we are recommending a process to go in parallel uh, with the response Scottish referendum, that by January next year, and linked to, to exactly what you just said, Tom, uh, there is a, a recognition by all major political parties that, that the issues they've all opined about, and, and in most cases actually quite actively supporting many of the things we and others have said, actually then going ahead and dealing with it because it's just as important for all the reasons we've heard here, if not more, economically at least, than issues about the Scottish referendum. And, and we also throw in the line there that we as a commission, you know, include you Alex, I'm sure, are going to meet together once in 12 months' time, hopefully somewhere fun, and we will reflect on what's happened in the 12 months since we ceased to exist. So, thank you. Thanks. Uh, and thanks for everyone for coming. On that final point, um, as Jim said, we will be... Um, convening in a year's time to uh, look at what's happened uh, during that period of time and to see what, how many of our recommendations have been implemented and where we are along the timeline. The critical period of, uh, that we set out is one that I think is going to be essential. Lord Heseltine has made the point in previous discussions that one of the key moments is the moment of the formation of a new government. Actually what they do in that initial conversation, even before you get to uh, the allocation of departmental responsibilities and the spending review. It has to be in the programme at the very outset of a new government because if it isn't, it won't be happening on the scale that is required. At the same time, cities, I think, have to behave as if they believe it's now happening. And I think that's what they are doing. And more of them, I think, need to step up to that uh, opportunity as well and see this as a big challenge. And certainly, it's something that I know the Centre for Cities in the, in the white paper that you're planning to do to think about the implementation will continue with, and it's something that we'll continue with here because this is an absolute priority. It seems to me it's a huge opportunity. It's the best we've had for decades, and it's one that we can't afford to squander. Thanks, everyone, for coming. <laughs>